I cannot give the talk in uh, Spanish because uh, I've done my whole career in the States, uh, but I'm from Panama. I did my bachelor's here uh, at the University of Panama. And uh, then 1984, I went to the University of Miami where I did my PhD. Uh, and then beyond that, then I did my postdocs at uh, New York University and Stanford and went back to Miami. So um, I first want to give special thanks to uh, Indy Cassette, uh, the Mello Group for supporting this uh, session and for inviting me to come here. Um, it's an honor to come, come back to Panama and uh, to see all this uh, amazing research that is going on at, uh, in Panama right now. Uh, I also want to give special thanks to Senacid uh, and Julio Escobar, who uh, is not in Senacid anymore, but was, is a good friend of mine, classmate from uh, in the old days. And I know he got an award uh, last night as being uh, one of the uh, persons that really push in the cassette to what it is today. So I've been working on this area of uh, ischemic preconditioning, but before I jump into the uh, whole area, I'm going to give you some very, very basic principles of brain metabolism. So um, as you know, uh, normal cellular function uh, depends on the supply of substrates such as oxygen and glucose. Uh, this is particularly important in the brain. Uh, the brain, despite being a very small organ proportionally to the rest of the body, consumes 15% of the total cardiac output, and about 20% of the total oxygen consumption. So it's an organ that is really utilizing a lot of the substrate and the energy. Now, this is logical because it's an uh, organ that requires uh, a lot of energy for electrical activity, consciousness, motor activity, everything that is going on is because of the electrical activity of the brain. So heart, brain, kidney are the three the organs that require more energy than anything else. And uh, in the brain particularly because of the electrophysiology that takes place, what you have is you continuously you change ion hemostasis in neurons. And when you do that, then you require the replenishment of ion gradients. And you do that by utilizing this pump, the sodium potassium pump that brings back ions to the normal levels. And this pump requires about 50% of the total energy. So when this pump is not working, uh, that's when you get into troubles. So uh, as I said, the brain is an organ that requires a lot of blood supply. And this is exemplif exemplified here uh, in this vessel painting imaging that uh, we did in a mouse brain. As you can, say, uh, you can see, it's highly vascularized. Um, and because of that, any time that you <clears throat> disrupt this blood flow, you get into troubles. OK, <clears throat> so a well-established axiom is that energy metabolism needs to be well-balanced. Uh, where you have energy-consuming pathways properly matched by energy-producing uh, pathways. When you disrupt this, uh, that's when you get into troubles. And that's what happens during ischemic stroke. So, uh, ischemic stroke is uh, basically when a clot is formed um, in any of the major arteries, and then it's dislodged and travels towards very small arteries. Um, it is a major problem all over the world. Just in the US, you have about 150,000 deaths per year, uh, about 800,000 cases per year. Um, all over the world is a large burden. In fact, we were at the stroke conference last week in Los Angeles, and uh, the statistics are remarkable, and some of the things that they were talking about is that, in fact, 
even though in developed countries the incidence is going down because now we know what causes a stroke, a stroke uh, in developing countries the incidence is actually increasing. So it's, it remains a major burden uh, all over the world. So the other, uh, uh, the, there are different types of strokes. You have the uh, embolic stroke, as I mentioned, and you have also the hemorrhagic stroke. It's a lower incidence, there are not as many cases, but it's pretty deadly. Um, but the pathophysiology is different. The other um, pathological condition where you have what we call cerebral ischemia is cardiac arrest. Um, is a large, uh, again, is a major leading cause of death and disability. You have about 300,000 uh, cases uh, of out of hospital and uh, 200,000 in in house, in hospital. Uh, and one of the major consequences is that you have significant brain injury uh, that will be the cause of death. In, in both cases, stroke and cardiac arrest, one of the problems is not that, that you have also motor deficits, but in addition to that, you will have um, cognitive deficits uh, that uh, lead to dementia and, and other cognitive major problems. So in cardiac arrest, the area that gets primarily affected in the brain is the hippocampus. Uh, is that area there highlighted? In animal models, we used uh, uh, the hippocampus looks slightly different, uh, as you can see there. Let's see if I can use this. Oh, so, so this area here, the C1 region of the hippocampus, is highly susceptible to the ischemic insult. Um, and if we blow up the image, you'll see exactly what I'm referring to. These are the pyramidal cells of the hippocampus, and you have significant pathology in the CA1 region of the hippocampus. Now, this region of the brain is extremely important because it is the area of the brain that plays a significant role in learning and memory. So that's why cardiac arrest patients and stroke patients exhibit significant uh, cognitive declines. This area gets affected, and therefore you do not learn as properly. All right, so the main goal in this field is to define the pathophysiological mechanisms that lead to the pathology of cerebral ischemia. We basically look for ways to reduce cell death or salvage areas that are impaired, but we can actually bring back. Um, I'd like to show this uh, slide from Uli Dernagel from Germany. Um, he's one of the leaders in the field of stroke research. <clears throat> he basically, uh, this is actually highly simplified, but is showing the cascade of events that takes place following an ischemic insult in the brain. You have what we refer to as excitotoxicity. Uh, what happens is you disrupt, disrupt the sodium potassium pump, uh, ion gradients are not controlled, and what happens is you have hyperexcitability followed then by release of excitotoxic uh, uh, neurotransmitters. And that continues a cascade of events that lead to mitochondrial dysfunction, inflammation uh, that cannot be controlled and will lead to apoptosis and cell death. So this is what we know from about 30, 30 to 40 years of research. So if you really want to find a way to protect a patient following a stroke, then just imagine what you have to do. You have to find chemicals or pharmacological agents, or some potential therapies, that will target all these pathways. And this is extremely complicated, as you know. And in fact, for about 20 years, there have been many clinical trials that have been uh, proposed and, and, and tried. 
uh, targeting many of these pathways, <coughs> and they have all failed. They have all failed because they are just targeting one of these pathways or because they are getting to the patient too late. So um, there have been a consortium of scientists that got together, developed what we call the STAIR criteria, and what they propose is other strategies that we could use to protect patients after a stroke. And one of them was to use a cocktail of drugs that can be used and that could target all these different pathways uh, of the pathology of stroke. This is extremely hard uh, for um, the ones that are in clinical trials here will know that to target all these pathways with a cocktail of drugs is extremely complicated. The other approach that was proposed is the use of a drug or fewer drugs that <clears throat> will have pleiotropic properties. That means that will target multiple pathways. And that's where uh, we jumped in with the field of ischemic preconditioning. So the idea comes from this old concept from Nietzsche uh, that said that which does not kill us makes us stronger. That's basically the main principle of what ischemic preconditioning is. So basically, you, what ischemic preconditioning is, is you induce a very mild, sublethal ischemic insult. You wait for a period of, of reperfusion where the cells can recover, and then, then you induce the lethal ischemic insult. And what happens is the tissue all of a sudden becomes resistant to this ischemic insult. <coughs> This is a, a depiction of what uh, the basic model is. You have what we call the ischemic preconditioning. You do this, let's say, two days prior to the ischemic insult. Uh, in our model, it would be just two minutes of global ischemia. Then you wait a period of about, about two days. Then you induce the lethal ischemic insult, which in a cardiac arrest model would be 10 minutes. And then you wait days and see the pathology. Now, just to give you an example, the whole idea, because I get this question for the last 20 years, you're not going to induce ischemic preconditioning in patients, right? <clears throat> that, that's not advisable. Basically, what we are proposing is when we understand the mechanisms of ischemic preconditioning, then we can come up with some potential drugs that will have pleiotropic properties and will protect the brain over time. So in this case, and I'm going to be talking about this drug for uh, a good portion of my talk, is a peptide that activates a PKC isozyme. And I will describe that in more detail later. So you can use that instead of the ischemic insult, and that will emulate ischemic preconditioning. So in this example, I show you before what happens after cardiac arrest to the hippocampus. So you, what you see in our models is this is a sham, this is ischemia. The whole area of CE1 is wiped out completely. And then if you precondition two days prior and induce ischemic insult, you get significant pr protection of the hippocampus. I mean, this is remarkable because, the, as I said, the brain is extremely sensitive uh, to, to these insults. <clears throat> now, I'm not going to get into all these details uh, or all these signaling pathways, but as I said, we have been working on this for more than 20 years. Uh, but just to give you an overview, um, they, we call some of the phases that induce the state of what we call ischemic tolerance. Uh, you have presynaptic events, chemicals that get released, prior to this, uh, immediately during the ischemic, the ischemic preconditioning insult. Uh, one of them is the adenosine, which makes sense. Adenosine is a byproduct of ATP uh, degradation. Uh, adenosine is released, activates some of its, its receptors, <coughs> and then adenosine promotes this state of tolerance. Paradoxically, 
one of the agents that promotes excitotoxicity, such as glutamate, also plays a role in the induction of ischemic tolerance. So if, in fact, you blocked one of its receptors, the NMD receptor, you can also induce ischemic tolerance. So all these pathways converge into phospholipase C that produces diacylglycerol, a major second messenger, and that then activates uh, a major signaling pathway that we propose is one of the main inductors of ischemic precondition. So PKC um, is a family of 12 isozymes. Um, there are the so-called classic type that require calcium and diacylglycerol. You have the noble type that only requires diacylglycerol for activation, and the atypical that do not require either one. So they have a hinge. Um, they basically have a closed conformation, uh, and that is closed when this pseudosubstrate here is bound. It binds the two portions of the uh, PKC protein. So when diacylglycerol is increasing levels, then it binds in this area and then releases this pseudosubstrate. <clears throat> the conformation change, and then PKC translocates to different sites. And this would be an example here, very simplified example. <clears throat> so you have diacylglycerol formation, which would bind to PKC, will induce the activation and the change in conformation, and then PKC will translocate to specific receptors. <clears throat> so in the past, we used to talk about PKC translocating and doing phosphorylating different sites, but it's very regulated. It's going to very specific subcellular sites. And these are receptor of activated C kinases um, that are very specific for each PKC isozyme. So in this case, for example, I'm showing an example of the mitochondria. There is a RAC in mitochondria. So that's what led us to define what is PKC doing in this ischemic preconditioning scenario. So we looked at synaptic function. And we also looked at mitochondria because there are racks in mitochondria as well. So I'll start with the uh, synaptic modifications that takes place in ischemic preconditioning. <clears throat> so one of the first things we did was to implant a microdialysis probe into the brain uh, two days after we induced ischemic preconditioning and measure the levels of these neurotransmitters. What we saw is that, in fact, in this case, um, you see significant increases of glutamate, as you would suspect, in excitotoxicity uh, taking place following ischemia. But if you precondition uh, rats two days prior, then you blunt these levels, these increases in glutamate. But interestingly, uh, the levels of GABA are significantly increased in preconditioned animals. So we went further and we used this whole cell recording technique uh, where we basically look at C1 pyramidal cells and began looking at GABAergic activity. Basically, you do this by inducing whole cell recording, looking at the pyramidal cell, blocking all the excitotoxic, eh, eh, excitatory uh, receptors, and by adding tetrodotoxin as well. When you do that, then you can detect the miniature postsynaptic GABA receptors, uh, potentials. And this is a typical example. But what we found is that, in fact, <clears throat> there is in preconditioning, and a, what we call PPC here would be the protein kinase C activation induced or emulated preconditioning. Uh, in this case, you see a significant increase in the frequency of these minis. This would be the gaba RG activity is significantly increased. And the amplitude is increased in the PKC epsilon induced preconditioning. Now, just to give you a very quick uh, overview how um, gaba activity works, 
these interneurons would be the ones releasing this uh, uh, GABA neurotransmitter, which will then decrease electrical activity in these pyramidal cells. So, if GABA is important, now we want to see uh, if we block the GABA-A receptor, which is one of the main receptors for GABA, what would happen um, if would, it, would this protect? And this is what we saw here. We use this model, which is the organotypic hippocampal slice. It's a culture model that, it, that we can maintain for weeks. And then we looked at, uh, again, sham ischemic preconditioning, and we added bicuculin, which would block the GABA-A receptor. And what you see is that cell death, as determined by propidium iodide, is significantly increased when you block uh, the GABA-A receptor. And this is summarized here. So that is a, an indication that GABA is one of the main factors inducing neuroprotection. All right, so another thing that we looked at, and this is a more recent publication, is the frequency of action potentials. Is just action potentials change? And what we found is that, in fact, the uh, frequency of action potentials is diminished uh, when you use this PKC epsilon agonist. <clears throat> we have several electrophysiological changes. The action potential threshold is changed here. The uh, after, after hyperpolarization is increased as well, which indicates how you decrease the frequency of action potentials. So that's, again, indicating that you're decreasing electrical activity and therefore decreasing metabolism, okay? And in that way, you are uh, decreasing the probability of having excitotoxicity once you have this chemical insult. So what's orchestrating all these effects? Um, so one candidate is the uh, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, BDNF. Um, in the pathways, and it's interesting that in the aging study that I saw, I saw NF-kappa B, um, defin definitely, again, in moderation, apparently that is protective. And this is something that we also published a few years back. So that leads to the increase in BDNF, and BDNF is a good candidate for the induction of, or, or these changes in electrophysiology that we see in preconditioned neurons. So uh, initial studies that we did by in situ hybridization, we actually looked at, in fact, mRNA levels were significantly increased following ischemic preconditioning in the hippocampus. That by Western blot, we looked at the levels of uh, uh, PK, uh, BDNF le uh, levels in hippocampus, and both in ischemic preconditioning or the PKC epsilon induced preconditioning, in both cases BDNF is significantly increased. And to fully define that this is actually happening in the CA1 region of the hippocampus, then we did immunohistochemistry and we could see new end positive BDNF overexpression. So this is taking place in the hippocampus as well. So that actually explains how this effect is taking place. So if BDNF is really the player, what we did next was to then block the track B receptor, which is the main receptor for BDNF. And we use this drug here, K252A. And what we saw is that in fact, you change all those properties that we saw uh, were changed by a PKC epsilon. Uh, you, or ischemic preconditioning. You see that you reverse the effect of preconditioning uh, in, in both types of preconditioning. All right, so if all of this is true, then we have to see the effect during the ischemic insult. The way we determine this is by looking at depolarization of neurons. Um, this is what we call uh, anoxic depolarization it takes place in uh, the brain during the ischemic insult, uh, and we can measure by putting an electrode in cells, inducing ischemia, which in this case is oxygen glucose deprivation, and you wait a time, and this is classical, about four or five minutes, if you lose oxygen or 
uh, blood flow, in four or five minutes your brain depolarizes. So it, it happens very fast. But if you precondition, then what you do is you delay this time to depolarization. So that's telling you already that that is a key mechanism by which you are protecting neurons. However, I want to point out that even though you are delaying an oxydepolarization, it's still happening, which suggests that you still have to do more to protect the brain. So next, uh, what we did is, again, to look at cell death, um, just to confirm that, in fact, all of this is linked. And in this case, if you, again, add the antagonist for the track B receptor, you block the protection by both ischemic preconditioning and the PKC epsilon agonist. All right, so that's basically the conclusion. This is the pathway that we think is working for these initial modifications that happen at the synaptic level. So the next target is mitochondria. Mitochondria is important because it is well established that plays a major role in the pathology that takes place over hours to days following this chemical insult, and that's our next uh, story here. So I'm not going to get into all these details. This uh, figure is busy, but suffice it to say that uh, mitochondria is involved in cell death in multiple ways. Um, the release of cytochrome C, apoptosis factors, apoptotic factors, uh, and so on and so forth. But it all starts here, right, in the electron transport chain. Uh, that's where you have the electron flow going from uh, substrates all the way to oxygen. That's where you require oxygen, and that's where you produce ATP, and the protein gradient formation is what forms the mitochondrial membrane potential, which is, which is key for the production of ATP. So is the first thing that we looked at is respiration activity in uh, mitochondria isolated for pre from preconditioned brains. And as you can see in, in preconditioned animals, this, uh, if you're not familiar, we add substrates for the different complexes. In this case, would be for complex one, pyruvate malate. Uh, for complex two and three, we add succinate and glycerol three phosphate. And to determine activity at the level of complex four, then we add ascorbate and TMPV. But what we are showing here is that in preconditioned mitochondria, days after, mitochondria function is preserved. So um, some of the things that we have been looking at is now translocation of uh, PKC epsilon to uh, the synaptosomal fraction. And what we saw is that, in fact, PKC epsilon translocates all the way to the synaptosome. We have actual uh, EM images uh, where you can see uh, mitochondria and is, uh, sorry, the synaptosomal fraction, synaptosomal images full of mitochondria. And that's expected because mitochondria also plays a major role in synaptic function. So in this model, what we did was then to add the agonist into this fraction and looked again at respiration. And what we found is that, in fact, PKC epsilon by itself is the main player in enhancing respiration at the level of the different complexes. It significantly increased respiration uh, at the level of complex one, three, and four. And we, in that paper, we actually showed that, it, that in fact, uh, is by phosphorylating specific subunits, all the different complexes. So next, we looked at uh, another important molecule, that's NADH, which is a major cofactor in respiration. This was two photon uh, fluorescent images uh, in cell cultures, looking at NAD following uh, the PKC epsilon peptide. And what we see is that also NADH levels are significantly increased. <clears throat> All right, so how can NAD be increased? Well, we need to understand the NAD biosynthetic pathway. 
Uh, there are a number of enzymes. One that we looked at in detail is NAMT. Uh, NAMT, we found that also is overexpressed when we induce ischemic preconditioning, um, and specifically, specifically in mitochondria. It's also expressed in vivo when we look at cortex in vivo. So the levels of <coughs> PKC uh, of NAD are significantly increased as well. So the consequence of increasing NAD, of course, are metabolic, has significant roles in increasing respiration. But NAD is a major cofactor with a number of enzymes. We heard about uh, DNA repair. PARPs require NAD, and in fact, is one of the major problems in uh, ischemia is that because there is so much oxidative damage going on following re uh, ischemia, uh, PARP activities increase significantly and utilizes too much NAD, which then gets the NAD away from the metabolic function. But there are other enzymes that get affected, uh, that play, that require NAD as a cofactor. Those are the sirtuins. We really got interested in sirtuins. Um, there was a story in 2000, going back now to longevity from the first talk. Uh, it was a big story about uh, CERT1, one, <coughs> one of the CERT twins, uh, playing a significant role in lifespan, in increasing lifespan. And in this editorial, of course, there were studies by David Sinclair from Harvard, where they found that CERT1 <coughs> uh, increased lifespan. So, Sir one, we got really interested because it's a major pleiotropic uh, enzyme, plays uh, many uh, play roles in, in many uh, different aspects that are actually happening during the uh, pathophysiology of stroke. You have uh, mitochondrial activity, inflammation, oxidative stress, apoptosis, and it also promotes global gene repression. <coughs> So two ways to activate CER1 uh, is by inducing calorie restriction. And another one is the use of this polyphenol uh, resveratrol. <coughs> now, resveratrol is found in red wine. Uh, many think that this is the molecule that is the one that gives you the benefits of red wine. Um, and of course, we like that story. So. What we did was to then emulate preconditioning in the same way we did with PKC epsilon. In this case, we used resveratrol. And what we did is to add resveratrol IP in, in rats two days prior and then induce ischemia two days later. And this is what we see. This is the normal neurons in the hippocampus, again. <coughs> At 10 milligrams per kilogram, we get a very nice protection very similar to ischemic preconditioning. Um, if you add then an inhibitor of CERB1, we did that by injecting a certain old uh, ICB, <coughs> then you block the protection. Now, before you all go and start drinking red wine like crazy, um, more is not better. So at higher dosages, you don't get protection. So forget this, please. This is... Uh, uh, people going crazy with this. Uh, but anyways, this is a, a slide that Kevin Kornowski, my PhD student, uh, brought. So if you really want to precondition yourself with red wine, do the calculations. <coughs> with the 10 milligrams per kilogram was what induced protection. So you'll need, if you only get 5 milligrams in one bottle of Pinot Noir, so you need to drink a lot of wine to get your 10 milligrams per kilogram. Weigh yourself. Anyways, our latest story, and this is very quick. Um, <clears throat> we have, of course, tested this in stroke models, in cardiac arrest models. In all these cases, we have seen protection. But recently, what we did is to look at the window of protection. And in this study <clears throat> by Kevin, Actually, a single application of resveratrol, if you wait 14 days after the application, you get significant protection. 
This is shown here. So this is actually a novel window that we have on cover of ischemic preconditioning. And this actually got the first prize award uh, for the 2015 Stroke Progress and Innovation Award that was given last week at the Stroke Conference in LA. Uh, so just to finish, I'll give you the clinical scenarios for ischemic preconditioning implementation. So again, everybody's going to say, when are you going to use these chemicals? Well, just think about it. You have a number of clinical scenarios, carotid, endorectomy, you have transient ischemic attacks, subarachnoid hemorrhage, and many neurological procedures that will actually, um, they, they could uh, result in a stroke later on. And most importantly, if you had a stroke and you survived, the incidence of stroke is extremely high. That means it's highly likely that you will have another stroke later. So you are a candidate for a preconditioning agent. So the population is huge, if you think about it, uh, 660,000 for stroke survivors, and so on and so forth. You look at the numbers, this is only in the US. If you add that in the world, this is a great uh, application, we think, uh, the use of pharmacological agents that can induce ischemic tolerance. <clears throat> so in conclusion, um, the signaling pathways activated by ischemic preconditioning exhibit pleiotropic properties that will lead to neuroprotection. In our case, <clears throat> PKC epsilon and resveratrol are two pharmacological agents uh, that have these, these same properties. And these agents that emulate preconditioning can be used in a prophylactic manner uh, to enhance ischemic tolerance uh, in patients prone to a potential stroke or cardiac arrest. So I just want to finalize by acknowledging the people that did all the work. Uh, it's a long list. Some people have already left and are in different positions. And some are still here, <coughs> even in Panama. Uh, and of course, the NIH, who has uh, supported uh, this research for almost 20 years, uh, and the American Heart Association. Thank you. We have time for two questions um, for Dr. Perez Pinson. Um, hi, Miguel. Wonderful, wonderful presentation. Um, I had a question about, you know, you presented very nicely the, the two approaches that are currently being followed, you know, in terms of uh, finding several drugs that can attack the pathways at the same time or these pleiotropic drugs. And I was just wondering, you know, pleiotropic, you know, factors are very tightly controlled because, you know, they are s so involved in many different uh, activities. And um, how is the control for the ones that you found or that you think are interesting for your uh, model? And then do you have any worries of, um, you know, if you are actually able to develop this as a treatment, any secondary effects uh, because of the, you know, how, uh, pervasive these molecules may be? Yes. Um, so it's a good question. I mean, it's, it's not simple. Nothing is simple, uh, especially in the human population. We use animal models that are mostly young, uh, healthy. They are not aged, as you will see in stroke patients or cardiac arrest patients. So. Um, and we are actually, that's part of the project that we have, is that we're going to try, we are testing things in age animals, uh, and then male and females, because that's crucial too, because there's different pathophysiology, male and females. So, um, the, the advantage is some of this. PKC epsilon will be a more difficult approach, even though um, other PKCs have been tested already in the clinic. But resveratrol, on the other hand, is a great agent. Um, because it's already been used as an anti-cancer -can agent. Uh, there are clinical trials that have been used. It's safe, much higher dosages than what we are proposing. 
so definitely we think that that's a good route to use. Uh, there are many other agents that have been delivered. Actually, David Sinclair and his company, uh, they actually came up with other uh, drugs that uh, apparently are more powerful activators of CER1. So those have not been tested yet, uh, but would be good candidates as well. So, um, so I think, you know, definitely is it takes a long time, as it was shown yesterday, uh, take a drug from the lab, from bench, all the way to uh, the bedside. It's going to take a long time. Uh, there is other people working in preconditioning that are testing other drugs. Uh, there's a toll-like receptor agonist, uh, a group in Oregon, uh, has really taken it all the way to preclinical studies. They've tested in monkeys. Uh, so it's possible that they are closer to use this already in the clinic. Now, there is another approach that I'm, I, for the sake of time, I didn't talk about, is called remote precondition. Remote precondition is basically when you occlude one limb, and that ischemia in one limb promotes protection in other organs. And it's been shown in the cardiac field to be, uh, has efficacy. Uh, we have tested it too, and it showed efficacy as well. So we have a neurology in our group uh, in our department who is already testing remote preconditioning in the clinic. Uh, and in China, there's a large clinical trial going on already with remote preconditioning. That's an easier one because it's relatively non-invasive, uh, but, uh, uh, but that's going to kind of lead the way for these other agents that I think will be more powerful uh, in inducing ischemic tolerance. Any other question? Thank you. As everybody heard your lecture, thank you very much. I have three questions. Yeah. First of all, do you use procaine in any of your cases? Because procaine improves the microvoltage of the membrane uh -huh. from 18 microvolts to 290. Uh -huh. Seems to me that is, is fantastic, the use of procaine in these cases. A second uh, the question is in, in relationship with EDTA. EDTA, I've been using EDTAs for about uh, 15 years. And the results in relationship with the um, projection of oxygen in the, in the vascular micro sections of the brain, we have seen that improve. So EDTA, um, you mean the chelator of calcium? EDTA. I got my training in, uh, in Las Vegas and in Chicago. I'm an orthomolecular uh, doctor. Uh, the third question is palladium. We have been working with the palladium that uh, Dr. Iguchi uh, got the Nobel Prize in 2010. And as uh, one, uh, one substance that produces uh, micro voltage inside uh, the uh, electricity, and uh, according to us, healing is the elevation of voltage. Healing is mathematics also. So our three questions. First, uh, the, the procaine. And second, the uh, EDTA. And third, the polyMBA. So uh, the first one, I don't know. I mean, I, uh, we've never tested that. Uh, that compound at all. I'm not familiar of anyone that has, has tested this in this chemic preconditioning scenario. Um, EDTA, uh, we have shown that calcium is an essential player in the induction of ischemic tolerance. So we have actually chelated calcium uh, in the cytosol, um, and that blocked the protection by ischemic tolerance. So in a way, you need, again, I need to clarify this. In an ischemic insult, too much calcium or calcium overload will be harmful. It's actually the leading cause of pathology, right? So in ischemic preconditioning, if you block uh, the influx of calcium or the levels of calcium in the cytosol, that will block ischemic tolerance completely. So. The, the bottom line, what we have realized is that you need to increase excitability. It's very similar to synaptic plasticity. It's like long-term potentiation. What you need is 
enhance calcium levels in the cytosol that will initiate what you have similar to long-term potentiation, like synaptic plasticity. And that will induce this metabolic change that will result, result in ischemic tolerance. So uh, that, that's the link that I would see with EDTA. And the final one is palladium. Palladium, you said? Palladium. So that, again, not no clue. But you're saying that increases electrical activity? That's, so. So uh, what, what I would say, the only thing I can tell you is that, again, just like I said, if you increase excitability for a period, that will induce ischemic tolerance. The only case I know that emulates ischemic tolerance in that way is, is called cortical spread depression, when you add KCL into the brain, and that overstimulates the brain. Uh, since it's mild, it's not going to cause pathology unless you keep adding KCL. Um, then you will induce this state of ischemic tolerance. There are a number of papers, original papers on preconditioning that use cortical spread and depression. Uh, so again, that's increasing excitability of the brain. So if that's the way it works, uh, it possible, possibly that would work too in preconditioning. Thank you very much, Dr. Perez Pinzon.